You know, it might seem futile to speculate about the nature of that which existed prior to any experience, or that which has not yet been explored. Futile or not, though, such speculation has occupied much of man's time in history. As we attempted to understand the mystery of our emergence, and what the world we find ourselves occupying is, it seems impossible to determine what it is that could have existed before anything else did. But myth attempts this task. You know, it seems impossible, yet it still does. We still yearn to do this in modern scientific methods have helped us attack it, attack this problem from new angles and converge on a thesis that agrees across all those domains. But myth uses metaphor and it doesn't exactly describe how the world functions in, in, in a dead, cold, ma material, objective sense. It doesn't tell you about gravity or quantum mechanics, although that could, uh, an argument I guess, could be made for that. But what it does tell us is human propensity to act certain ways, and not just the individual, but groups of humans. This little excerpt here I'm going to read should uh, spread a little more light on that. Metaphor links things to things. It compares situations with other previously known situations. Concentrating on the phenomenological, the affective, the functional, and motivational features that the linked situations share. Through and through such linkage, what might otherwise remain entirely mysterious can begin to become The process of metaphorical representation provides a bridge, an, an increasingly communicable bridge, one that can be relayed from generation to generation, between that which can be directly, directly experienced. story because it's interesting, but why would it be interesting if it didn't have meaning and if it has, if it does contain a meaning, what is this meaning and how can we relate, how can we relate to it and how can it relate to our lives in modern times, you know we're so sophisticated. if you're more conservative, what do they have to teach us 
we arrive at this place in modern times all on our own? Let's find out. You guys heard of Osiris? And I'm not talking about that ridiculously fat skateboard shoe developed in the late 90s. Osiris was a primeval king, a legendary ancestral figure who ruled Egypt wisely. His evil brother, Set, or Seth, um, most likely the etymological or philological uh, origin of the word Satan, whom he did not understand, of course, rose up. So when Seth rises up, he kills Osiris. Osiris is dead, and that means he sends him to the underworld, sent to the underworld, and dismembers his body so that it, you know, head, arms, limbs, phallus, his sexual organ, so that it can never be found. The death of Osiris signifies two important things. One is the tendency of a static ruling idea, a system of valuation of a, uh, or a particular story. No matter how initially magnificent or appropriate to become increasingly irrelevant with time. And two, signifies the dangers that necessarily accrue to a state that forgets, that forgets or refuses to admit to the existence of the immortal deity of evil. Now when you get naive and forget about evil, Seth comes in and overpowers the fair and wise king. Seth, the king's brother and opposite, represents the mythic hostile twin or adversary who eternally opposes the process of creative encounter with the unknown. It can be thought of as sometimes, sometimes Seth, or the evil brother, the opposition to creative exploration, usurps the throne, overthrows the king, 
their actions necessarily speed the process of decay, endemic to all structure, because everything has to be constantly updated. Things fall apart. Osiris, although great, was naive. He was naive in some profound sense, a very profound sense. He was blind, at least, to the existence of immortal evil. This blindness and its resultant incaution brings about, or at least hastens, Osiris's demise. So, Osiris has a wife, as befits the king of order. Isis, as Osiris's mythic counterpart, is representative of the positive aspect of the unknown. She is possessed of great magical powers, as might be expected, given her stature. She gathers up Osiris's scattered pieces and makes herself pregnant with the use of his dismembered phallus. This story makes a profound point. The, G the degeneration of the state, or any domain of order, and its descent into chaos serves merely to fructify that domain and to make it pregnant. In chaos lurks great potential. In chaos lurks great potential. Potential for destruction and potential for creation. When a great organization disintegrates, falls into pieces, the pieces might still usefully be fashioned into or give rise to something else, perhaps something more vital and still even greater than was before. Isis therefore gives birth to a son, Horus, and Horus who returns to his rightful kingdom to confront his evil uncle is that which is created. So Horus fights a difficult battle with Seth, ultimately as the forces of evil of course are difficult to overcome, and loses an eye in the process, but nonetheless Seth is overcome, and Horus even recovers his own eye. Now the story could stop there. The narrative integrity is intact, with the whole, with the now whole and victorious horse's uh, well-deserved ascension to the throne. However, Horus does not stop there. He does the unexpected, descending voluntarily to the underworld to find his father Osiris. It is, it is the representation of this move, descending into the underworld, extending the more simple structure of what still would have been a complete narrative that constitutes the brilliant original contribution of Egyptian theology. Of course, this is very similar to ancient Mesopotamian myths, which perhaps were even older than these myths, where the god Marduk voluntary, voluntarily journeys to the underworld of Tiamat. So Horus discovers Osiris in the underworld. He offers his recovered 
eye to his father so that now Osiris can see once again. They return united and victorious and establish a revivified kingdom. The kingdom of father and son is an improvement over that of the father or son alone as it unites the hard-won wisdom of the past, that is, of the dead, of the dead, with the adaptive capacity of the present, that of the living. And this is the re-establishment and improvement of the domain of order. The Egyptian pharaoh, like the Mesopotamian king, served as material incarnation of the process that separates order from chaos. Simultaneously, the pharaoh king literally embodied the state. Finally, the pharaoh king was the rejuvenator of his own father. The ideal pharaoh king was therefore the exploratory process that gave rise to the state, the state itself, and the revivifying or exploratory process that updated the state when it was in danger of too conservative ossification. Ossification meaning calcifying or kind of congealing or rigidifying. This massively complex and sophisticated conceptualization is given added breadth and depth by consideration of its psychological element. The state is not merely cultural, it's also spiritual. As custom, as custom and tradition is established, it is inculcated into each individual within that state and culture, and becomes part of their intra-psychic structure. The state is therefore personality and social organization, simultaneously. Personality and social order conjoined in the effort to keep the terror of chaos at bay, or better still, united in the effort to make something positively out of it, not merely be defensive, but exploratory, offensive, creative, positively effective. This means that the hero king who establishes, embodies, and updates the social world is also the same force that establishes, embodies, and updates the intra-psychic world, the personality. And that one act of update cannot necessarily or reasonably be distinguished from the other. In improving the world, the hero improves herself. In improving himself, he sets an example for the world. Now I love the interpretation of these myths and kind of cross-referencing, cross-examination of myths, because it's, for me, just starting out in this journey of exploring my past, which I consider to be it seems new age, and it's naive on 
a lot of levels, but I think it behooves us to pay attention in, before we hastily, haughtily dismiss those stories of how to act or what has happened in the world as a mere child's imaginary narratives to help go to bed to. Although they can serve as that, no reason they can't be multiple things at once. I think that's just the point, is that these are metaphors, they're not literal truths. They're metaphors that are our culmination of attempts to explain what one mere life cannot do. I mean, we are a social species by nature. Doesn't it make sense that our aggregate collective stories would be integral to the development of each individual? Could we really become the people we strive to be and ideally would like to be? The ideals we look up to, whether it's John Wayne or whether it's Jesus or so much that has been learned, so many lives that have been dedicated to understanding these stories, that you're throwing the baby out with the bathwater if you dismiss them as foolish and childish. And speaking of acknowledging those that come before you, um, big shout out to French Whisper, by the way, speaking of that, but I was talking more generally about this book here. This is Maps of Meaning. And this is the book that Jordan Peterson wrote almost 20 years ago now. So I'm sure there's going to be some big 20th anniversary edition coming out. And it was, up until last year, the only book he had ever written. And he spent, I mean, it's 500 pages. It's probably got just as many references as it does pages. And he is breaking down modern psychological research in cognitive perception and personality and correlating it and trying to cross-reference from as many angles as he can across myth, philosophy, literature, and experience in the history, of course, and trying to develop a concept. What is the common thread across the Tao Te Ching, Buddhism, all the Abrahamic religions, Mesopotamian, Egyptian religions. And he is building upon the work of many people, but these three people could certainly be. Consciousness. 
the origin and history of consciousness. Nietzsche wrote the genealogy of morals, trying to trace back what it was that led primitive man, humans, to develop the ideas of morality and how we should act and when to keep promises, when to feel guilty, when to, well not so much when, but he, he is developing the idea that these became embodied actions probably long before we were able to consciously represent them and discuss them as abstract ideas. Long before that, we were in monkey troops, paying attention, and the things we paid attention to, we did so out of sheer instinct. When we're grooming somebody, because we were groomed, we notice a fight break out, and we remember that that person the one who started the fight, if it was, if they were unjust, or if they had a reason to. And we remember it as a form of debt, and, oh, kind of debt and debtor relationship. And then, as our consciousness develops, gets more sophisticated, we were able to, perhaps, communicate and conceive of the future, in which case we're able to make promises about how our own bodies would act in the future in return for social cooperation. So, Nietzsche was uh, very, very, very interested in Charles Darwin's theory of evolution and tried to apply that to his philological studies about myth and morality in early religions. Early religions. And then Carl Jung comes along and uh, heavily influenced by Freud and Nietzsche. Read everything both of those guys did and studied under Freud and eventually broke off from Freud um, for uh, basically for trying to take Freud's ideas a little too far according to Freud but Jung decided that the concept of culture is so infused in the way we act and cooperate from our families to villages to entire nations that it's worth studying, and it's certainly worth studying to be able to elucidate all those, all the wisdom, all the pearls of wisdom that might be scattered throughout these stories of seeming ancient obsolescence. And then this guy. Eric Neumann comes along and he comes along and takes what Nietzsche did. Jung took that and increased its breadth and depth into history. And then Eric Neumann studied Jung and Nietzsche and Freud and said, you know what, what if we could trace through prehistoric myths and some of the most ancient symbols, such as the Ouroboros right here, and conceive of consciousness as the slowly evolved adaption to be able to abstract concepts and ideas. Play with them in your head. 
before actually implementing them in the world so that your bad idea can perhaps die and not you. And the more and more sophisticated we got, the closer and closer we were to representing the actual neurological structures in our brain, the things that direct our attention. For instance, when you're walking through the woods and you see a snake pop out on the, on the right, and you see a log, a dead still log on the left, what directs your attention to the snake and not the log, even if they look similar, same color, same thickness? Apparently there's neurological structures that have evolved through millions and millions, not just one million years since Homo erectus, not just five million years since we diverged from the apes, the great apes, not just fifteen million years since the great apes and us diverged from other monkeys, and not just maybe sixty. 60 or so million years ago when monkeys and simians diverged from uh, other mammals. You get the point. Perhaps these neurological structures in our brain that direct our attention innately imbue meaning to the world that we are a part of, that make time disappear when we're in a deep conversation that we find meaningful, or we're in, when we're in deep thought about the nature of the cosmos. It makes time disappear. But what is it that makes time disappear? What is it that makes our skin crawl with awe? And that's what this guy tried to think about. So, I titled this myth. Well, I guess I'm going to title it The Purpose of Myth. And, of course, like I said, I haven't even read this book. I've listened to a lot of his lectures, and, of course, I understand some of the general concepts, but there's so much. The reason he's so believable and credulous, and I'm so, he's so credible in my mind, is that he, Jordan Peterson, is taking not just one myth, but many, many myths, not just ancient history, but modern history, not just religion, but psychology and philosophy, science, and trying to coalesce and, and um, distill, distill what is common, what all of these can verify. And uh, he comes up with this pretty interesting little uh, di diagram right here. This diagram has order on the inside, chaos on the outside, and it has the Great Mother, which Eric Neumann researched and found to be one of the most archetypal, most ancient mythological stories and conceptions and symbols to exist pretty much ubiquitously across the world. That's why we call it Mother Earth, and perhaps Father Time. And the concept of the Great Mother is that which has the ultimate, the final word in the world. It's nature, it's that which exists outside us. The Great Father is that which 
defines the habitable order that we have created by exploring the Great Mother. And then the Great Sun, the archetypal Sun, which uh, interestingly enough is not just in Christianity, that's just its most recent permeated offshoot of it. But uh, a lot of people would argue, I think Peterson would argue as well, that it's the most articulated, the most finely explored version of the archetypal sun. And that is which has its eyes open like Horus and recognizes the evil within the organized state, defeats it. Although it might lose an eye, it doesn't die himself. And then once it's defeated, it doesn't just maintain the previous stagnant, plateaued manifestation of order that had existed before, but it actually updates it, it makes it more commensurate with the latest knowledge. So the Great Father is everything that's come before us, and it's everything we worked to build up to this point. And the point is of that story is that a horse doesn't want to just dismiss or lazily ride on the coattails of, uh, or tailcoat, coattails, I don't know, of, um, of those that, those that have come before him. He wants to create something new by standing on the shoulders of giants, as Isaac Newton once famously, famously said. And this triage, triad, triad of mythical representation is famous and found throughout many, many, many myths, and I don't know, I think that's very interesting. Egyptians, Mesopotamians, so many others rely on myth to inform them about precautionary tales, to give precautionary tales of, uh, so many of the things that have happened in the past. I just feel like there's so many lives that have already lived and died. And slowly accumulated to what we are now. And whether you think that's, I guess, teleologically, because there is an ultimate purpose and we're ultimately, inevitably, aiming towards it. Or if you think that it's been a very much a an organic, dynamic process, and a lucky one at that, that has led to our current status, current technological achievements. Um, nonetheless, those that have come before us have so much wisdom to share, um, I think it's almost indispensable, and I think it's not a matter of choosing to keep or deny the sacred texts so much. As finding an appropriate way to look at them and perceive them and still hold some of the most valuable elements in them in high esteem without trying to clumsily worship Santa Claus, if you will. And so this really, really, really cool article, um, by the way, no, let me look it up. So to round this off, shout out to Joseph Logan on my Reddit video for suggesting that I tap in to Cora the website. It's full of answers from well-read, knowledgeable people. And one of the answers to 
How is religion any different than hailing Big Brother in Orwell's 1984? Both have leaders that people have not really seen before, but demand the faith of the people. And this guy Ryan Cash, C-A-S-H, I guess Ryan can be spelled different ways, so it's R-Y-A-N-C-A-S-H, answered, I thought a very thoughtful and, of course, um, I'm biased because uh, I thought it was a very thoughtful answer because he mentions a lot of the people that I'm currently trying to study. So he says, The tyranny of the state in 1984 could be viewed as a one-sided ideological projection of the negative aspects of the great father motif. And this one, of course, is already present present in many myths. And you see each of those have a positive and negative dimension. And the great father is order on the positive side, tyranny on the negative great mother is destruction on the negative side, creation on the positive. And the archetypal sun is that which updates the system, which can be the hero or adversary. Which could be the destruction or creation of the existing order. So a group that operates under the motif of an absolute tyranny is uh, ill-functioning. It's an ill-functioning system. So it's ideal when you have a juxtaposition, a balance, a yin and a yang of order and tyranny, and there's something like the hero that walks that line, and order and chaos, rather, I guess, and it doesn't stay stagnant in order and decay until he dies, but doesn't go off into chaos and get overwhelmed until he dies. He walks that line and says, order is what I have, what my society has given me, what I've been born into. It's all that which is good and all that which is bad that needs to be eradicated without collapsing the overall structure. So a proper mythology offers an assimilation of the individual into society so that there is a balance between the order of protection with as little dogmatic tyranny as necessary. And this allows for the expansion. And this allows for the expansion, the expansion of society into unknown territories. It allows for the transformation of the social order when it becomes overly dogmatic, antiquated, static, or fails to meet the needs of the environment, the great mother in which it resides. In other words, if there's a supernova imminent, I think a dogmatic, tyrannical, static system would not account for the great mother that is that supernova. That supernova is 
major mythological systems this guy can think of allow for a death and rebirth of the great father. symbolic form to the Great Father image, which again is a motif for the destruction of stale societal orders and rebirth of a new, more healthy system. So, you have examples being the Egyptian myth of Horus overcoming the corrupt Seth, the Roman myths of Jupiter being devoured by Saturn. His father, Saturn, by the way, and then bursting through his stomach. And then Marduk of Mesopotamian origin having to confront the destructive chaos, the chaos of the Great Mother, after its brothers slay the Great Father. One of the pathological, the pathologies tyrannical political systems as seen in 1984 is that they don't allow for this process of rebirth due to new challenges and events. Furthermore, the demands of society a, uh, a hailing big brother is only one function in an effective mythological system. There are four functions of myth. system once the heliocentric model has already been proven. So it needs to be updated and uh, coalesce with scientific understandings. The third, so we have the mystical, the cosmological, mystical imbuing all in us, experiencing all, which is a type of meaning cosmological, which explains the world and is in concert, in concert with the scientific understanding. Then we have the third, the sociological function, which relates the individual and the individual needs to those of the, the society. them as a useful organism to support and validate a certain social order. So again, it's almost like these are forms of meaning. You have your individual meaning, which is the awe in the 
sheer mystery and, and grandiosity of complex and large scale structures of the universe. And even the complex doesn't have to be large like a nebula in the far reaches of our galaxy. But the complex could be something as seemingly, as seemingly trivial as the person you choose to date. How complex do you think you are? Do you understand yourself? And perhaps what makes you think that person is simple, a simple binary organism to be explained by black or white, right? Maybe the most complex things we can possibly ever interact with are right here, right here on Earth, and it's us, and that's, uh, that's something profound. And then fourth is the pedagogical, and I had to look this word up. Pedagogical means the ability to teach, um, relating to uh, teaching, and uh, this pedagogical function allows an understanding of the life cycle of an individual, and how to place themselves in accord with the developmental points in their journey. So it's kind of a, um, an idea, a theory about how each individual in the society learns. How every individual learns. How we learn. And how we grow as individuals. And as with any theory, it must be validated by multiple experimentations. Multiple empirical sets of evidence. So each person's life an analogous milestone or series of milestones and these milestones are things that are common to us all we have childhood we have adolescence after puberty during puberty we have late adolescence nowadays we have adulthood we have the father and mother figures we have and we have the wise grandparents who have all this accumulated first-hand experience of life. To, and what good is that experience if it can't be translated? What is the meaning of having all these experiences? you love and perhaps make their lives a little bit a little bit better pull something extract something out of life so you can give it back give it back tenfold and who knows where we will end up but it's guaranteed to provide meaning for sure and um then he goes on lastly to relate Eastern versus Western religions in, in general. And he thinks the West suffers from the literal literalism of the Bible. When you have a mythological system that are meant, although it was, although it was implicit. A metaphor. I don't think we have updated ourselves enough as a culture to account for the non-literal um, nature of the stories we are exposed to in the West. So in this, there's just there's too much trivial conflict when you try to adhere to a scientific worldview. When you have a literal scientific 
worldview and a metaphorical, mythical worldview when you try to you try to put them on you try to equate them and perhaps it's more of a dance, more of a cross reference. This tells you what what things do in the world. But it doesn't tell you how consciousness works. And this tell you tells you the pre propensities of consciousness to do certain things and see certain things in groups of consciousnesses and societies. It says we're bound to create order and then something corrupts it. And it's bound to happen. You can never evade evil within an organized structure. It's always going to exist. Even when you stomp one out, someone else will take the easy route and be selfish and collapse. But perhaps only to the extent that the organization stifles creativity and learning and updating. And then the collapse is that much harder. So, this problem with us conflating literal scientific objective truth with another sense of objective truth that is, has been true for as long as there have been people around to transmit stories about how things are grown and they collapse from within due to internal decay and tyranny. That's another type of objective truth because it's ubiquitous. It's verified across multiple cultures and across long spans of time. And you can't conflate these two. But in the East, some Eastern religions, such as the Hindu that recognized as early as 800 BC, so about 3,000 years ago, in the Upanishads, that the gods and deities were projections of, projections of psychological phenomena, psychological phenomena, and energies. In modern Western religions, hold on to stale cosmological ideals. So, in this regard, many religions of the West today do in fact act as the tyrannical, radically non-updated fathers of, uh, of, of these, these great fathers of that motifs, that motif asking only for obedience to a stale cosmological structure with little justification or benefit to the group in aiding, aiding very little in the exploration of the great mother, the eternally unknown. the undifferentiated experience, creation itself. This is incredibly unfortunate because humans can't escape their need for the learning, the um, pedagogical function, the ability to teach, be taught, and constantly update the structures that we live within. can't escape being a human that must transform into different stages of life and confront our journey unto death. We can't escape the need to experience an artistic awe of nature and cosmos and structure and being just existing. An inspiration for our aspiration in the terrible mystery of being. And one key to understanding this dynamic might be that uh, that our current si situation is actually relatively new. I mean, the scientific mindset, the scientific method, 
as a rigid um, cultural phenomena in a structure, a uh, very much transmuted, not transmuted, trans, as a very profound and practical and pragmatic and useful system of ideas is really, really new on the scene. It's really only maybe 500 years old, starting with around the time of Francis Bacon. Maybe, maybe 700 years old if we go back. But uh, in the dawn of tens of thousands of years of cultural evolution, conscious evolution, societal evolution, individual, individual evolution, it's yesterday. But this is cool, and this is optimistic, because that means we're in a transitional period. With, um, in science has only recently disproved the cosmological understandings of our current very popular western myths um, you know for a couple hundred years now a few hundred years but it's I love the way this guy says it Ryan Cash he says it's possible about all I have to say about that. As always, I hope you guys enjoyed this. Um, you guys like myth and history, and I thought while I was reading this, and it was still fresh in my brain, and I was still extremely enthused about it, I wanted to relay, try to with this information.
perhaps even how to best go about creating a better, not just a newer, but a better future.